Hello, my name is Noah Orbach. I am a third year master's student in the International Education and Development Program here at Teachers College. Hi, I'm Christina Torres. I am a fourth year PhD candidate in the Science Education Program here at Teachers College. Noah, can you please tell us a little bit about your amazing background and how you got involved in sustainability work in the first place? In my home country, Israel, um, I co-founded a nonprofit online platform for micro-volunteering called Helpy, and also a, another organization called Pendulum, which is a, an agency, a creative ag agency that helps um, organizations and communities and causes that we care about with their um, content creation. On my first uh, semester here, I took a class with Dr. Oren Pismoni Levy, climate education and sustainability education class. My first ever, um, you know, introduction to this world. And I guess I got hooked because I'm a very um, pragmatic person. So it just felt like the most urgent <laughs> topic. Sustainability is a common thread throughout my entire career. My, I'm born and raised in New York City. I'm from Staten Island, but I've lived in the Harlem, Washington Heights area for about a decade now. And I went to school at the City College of New York for my undergrad and my first master's degree, uh, where I studied beetles. And I specifically studied the community structure of a family of wood boring beetles called Cerambicids in the Neotropics to kind of ask these larger questions around climate change. And it was through this work as a bachelor's and master's student that I realized that my favorite part about science is talking about it. It's doing things exactly like this. Coming to that realization took me down a few different avenues. So similar to yourself, I also was in entrepreneurship for a little while. I had a startup called See Through. It was rebranded from Skinno to See Through, where we reimagined people's relationship with science uh, through the products that they use every day, uh, trying to kind of demystify the chemistry behind personal care products. And then I started teaching at the Fashion Institute of Technology, uh, where I teach an ecology and environmental problems course to students that are going into sustainable fashion. And it was the nexus of these two experiences using technology to think about people's relationship with science and examining my undergraduate's relationship with science, where I started to think about these larger questions around how do we change people's relationship with science to think about the largest existential threat that we're currently facing, climate change. Your work here at TC, how do you engage um, students, faculty, and staff on campus with sustainability? My first touch point into sustainability at Teachers College was also with Oren. Uh, I started at TC back in fall 2020, so we were still in virtual COVID pandemic times. Um, and Oren was actually doing a seminar during uh, the orientation week on sustainability. And I sent him an email immediately afterwards. He had this fellowship to think about ways of engaging youth climate activists throughout New York City. So that was my first touch point here at TC, collaborating with master's students and doctoral students outside of my program to create a program which would then be called Youth at the Center, which works with youth climate activists throughout New York City. And this program is housed under a larger center here at TC called the Center for Sustainable Futures, one of which is a research practice partnership with New York City Public Schools. We do work with teachers and students and sustainability coordinators we also think about these larger questions of sustainability here on Teachers College campus. So Noah, do you want to talk a little bit more about our student activism work here on campus? The Sustainability Task Force is a student organization that focuses on uh, sustainability culture and advocacy here on campus. And we kind of um, saw this main gap here on campus. We raise professionals here, but we they, they come out of here not necessarily prepared to a very different environment and world. So one thing that we focus on is literacy, so like what students actually learn here. And the other main thing is the policies here on campus, how much um, energy we use, our emissions, um, the waste management, all of these things that as a very big institution, 
we obviously have a large footprint. Two years ago, we were able to um, s circulate a petition that uh, received a lot of attention and uh, went to the provost and the president of TC. And um, actually now, sustainability is one of the main priorities of the administration of the campus. There was an audit done by a, an external company to look at the practices here, and we hope to have a set plan and commitment and goals on how we plan to change um, what was found in the, in the audit. And then the one success, uh, the other success that we can um, mention is the uh, statement of the investment. So um, TC's endowment, basically our money, is no longer invested in those very, very harmful industries um, of fossil fuels. You know, I kind of reflecting on this three-year journey that we've had from this idea from a petition to, you know, meeting with administration, meeting with faculty, meeting with students for these three big buckets, right, divestment, getting everybody at TC educated, literacy, and then thinking about our buildings, facilities, how do we translate these types of ideas to thinking about higher education as a whole? Do you think that these big buckets that we addressed here at TC are some of the largest gaps in higher education around sustainability? Or do you think that there is a more unique place-based approach we need to think about when examining different places of higher education? Actually, schools around us, namely Columbia uh, main campus, um, actually does have a big, more um, holistic plan of how to tackle these issues. Um, I think as a graduate school, we have students coming in and going very quickly. I think the biggest challenge here is to really get like a momentum of people to, to push for these um, goals on campus. Our community members here specifically um, where we wear many hats as um, educators, psychologists, health professionals, um, we can try to think of like, no matter who you are, where you are, what can you do? So can you give us a little bit of advice? Specifically here at T TC, everybody has a role to play. Um, climate change is a public health crisis. It isn't just an environmental crisis like the way a lot of people think about it. So when we think about training the next generation of public health professionals, we need to understand that climate needs to be a part of that. No future teacher should be graduating TC without understanding how to communicate the urgency of the climate crisis, but also how to empower their future students through climate action. And it's understanding how to do that in an interdisciplinary way, not just in a way that is a footnote in a science class. And finally, we're also training the next generation of psychologists. Climate anxiety is a really hot topic right now, whether you're reading the New York Times or possibly experiencing it yourself. We need to be training the next generation of psychologists to be interacting not just with youth, but adults in the topic of climate anxiety. Uh, so I think here at TC, we are poised to be the next leaders of sustainability, to not just think about how we're training future generations, but how are we supporting our local communities here in New York City and beyond. But we specifically focus a lot through our work at STF and at CSF on climate advocacy specifically. So, do you want to start and talk a little bit about on what it's like to work with teachers and students and activists on climate action here in New York City through our work? One of the main things that we know from research is that educators are very much interested in teaching about climate change. At the same time, they, are, they feel unprepared. So, we at the Center for Sustainable Futures um, we had been working last year and uh, uh, will continue doing this work with a, um, an NSF uh, grant on a summer institute for New York City public schools educators. We covered all kinds of topics from um, climate anxiety and distress, uh, environmental justice. We had a workshop on reimagining and meditating on the kind of future that we want to see. And then, of course, we dug into what it actually means in the classroom and how do we teach both in 
ELA, math, social studies, and science with, you know, the uh, um, necessity of uh, having to comply with standards, how do we teach these topics? We were working specifically with elementary teachers and we will continue with um, middle schools and then high schools in the next uh, few summers. Another thing I can mention is a, um, a few different research projects, one of which where we work together is um, exploring teachers' perceptions on their students' engagement with the subject. So wh what do teachers see? How do teachers see their um, students' relationship, um, knowledge, concern, um, activism, engagement with climate change? And first analysis and results coming soon, but we can s definitely say that we see a, a, a trend where in lower income schools and schools that predominantly serve minorities, um, the teachers see their students as less engaged, less concerned, less active about the topic. We're working with the teachers, we're doing this work with sustainability coordinators to reimagine how to democratize climate change education in New York City, but we're also working with the youth. I right. talked a little bit about it before, uh, specifically with youth climate activists. We've been surveying youth climate activists at Fridays for Future marches, which happen twice a year, uh, to really understand the motivations and emotions and the learning around these types of marches. And like I also said before, we also have youth at the center, uh, where we're engaging uh, youth climate activists to empower other youth in their schools and throughout the five boroughs in New York City using climate change storytelling. So we're trying not to keep this knowledge not just in the spaces of, of activist spaces where youth are already engaged. Right. Uh, we're trying to use youth and sustainability coordinators and teachers to take this message onward. With that, like, what are some lessons that you were able to learn from working with teachers, working with youth on climate action? Doing an analysis of the types of emotions teachers mm. and students feel about climate change, it harkens to all of the things that you think about, right? The anxiety, the anger, the need to do more. But there's also an equal amount of hope. Right and action and wanting to inspire others through this work. And I think that has inspired me more than anything else to see that while they do have these negative emotions attached to the, cl the climate crisis as a whole, they still have hope. And the teachers are willing to sit with us through their summers to learn about climate and on their free time, bring it back and change their lessons right. to integrate this. The youth are sitting in Zoom rooms and in physical rooms. They're painting signs. They're talking with each other about action. So nothing has inspired me more, I think, than their hope amidst the darkness that exists in climate crisis. Do you have a story of a climate advocate that has inspired you, whether that's youth or a teacher? I learned so much during the past few years um, about, in general, how indigenous communities look and work and engage with the nature. Um, as a mother myself, I think when we, you know, when we think of how and when to start, really the most basic thing is our connection to what's around us. Mm -hmm. And um, as someone from outside of the US, I was not at all connected or, or aware of, you know, the different communities and what's actually what actually go, goes on um, here on, on indigenous land in reservations, um, you know, it doesn't have to be as far as the Amazon. It, it's it's right here in yeah. New Jersey where um, really inspiring work is is being done. We tend to focus, especially in our work, a lot on the youth and the modern climate movement uh, started by Greta Thunberg and through the Fridays for Future organization, Extinction Rebellion, Sunrise. But this is not new. And indigenous groups, especially in the U.S., have been at the forefront of this crisis, right. fighting for clean water and clean air for many, many, many years. 
all of the youth that I've engaged with through Youth at the Center have their own unique stories of how they ended up in the movement. So it's very difficult to choose just one. But if I had to, um, there are many, many kids. I have many kids. Um, a Johnny. So a Johnny Stella I have worked with since the beginning of Youth at the Center when he was a freshman in high school. He is now a senior in high school. I can't believe it. Um, and he started a nonprofit at nine years old uh, after a teacher inspired him to get involved in climate action. Wow. So I, his story is just, to me, the epitome of the power that we have as educators, and loose term, whether you're a formal educator, informal educator, even if you're sitting having conversations at the dinner table, where we all have a role to play in that communication effort, how powerful it is to speak up and talk about it and teach others, because you never know how many lives you'll touch to get involved in sustainability. What types of skills do you think that people need to have to get involved in this work? any skills. <laughs> um, no, it's anybody can be involved at any level. Um, and I think that is the beautiful part about the work that we do. It's hard work. There are a lot of things that need to change. Like we've explained, we need to think about educational systems as a whole. We need to think about facilities and buildings. We need to think about money and finances and where our money is coming from and invested in. But at the end of the day, we all have touch points into sustainability. Whether it's through your work or your daily life, sustainability requires no specific skill set. Climate change is this daunting problem and it's crippling. So if somebody wanted to get more involved in sustainability, what are some small scale actions that people can take right now? I'll start by um, debunking a myth and say that we can and should keep recycling. <laughs> However, the waste sector um, accounts for 6% of emissions in New York City, whereas the building sector accounts for 71%, um, followed by transportation, which accounts for 30%. So I think for the average person, um, average student, uh, alum, I would say reach out to your landlord or your board of the building or the um, management company and inquire about all the different um, incentives that are coming now from both federal and state legislation to incentivize buildings to change how they are managing their energy specifically, um, energy efficiency, and what kind of grid uh, powers mm -hmm. the building. So anyone in New York, which I didn't, it's really great to know, I think it's very important, anyone can subscribe to shifting from um, the regular Con Edison bill mm -hmm. to a clean energy um, supplier. It still goes through Con Ed, but you can literally get uh, electricity powered by solar or wind um, energy, which is great and easy to do. You can um, reach out to your bank uh, if it's Chase, you can leave it um, <laughs> because they uh, are the biggest, biggest funders of the fossil fuel uh, industry. You can let your bank know why you leave them for a different um, bank. And you can ask if they can, you know, consider changing their ways. Um, if you're a student still here at TC, you can literally raise your hand as often as possible and let your professor know that this is something that you care about. So just talking about it yep. um, with your classmates, with your professors, asking for more resources in the syllabi, um, making sure that it is a priority here on campus. And if you're an, al an alumnus and you have resources where you work that can support the movement, uh, whether you want to support youth in the movement in Fridays for Future or adults that are working with Sunrise, Extinction Rebellion, et cetera. It's triage. There's so many organizations that are doing this work locally on the ground. Right. They always need people to join and they are always in need of resources. Maybe let's talk about a little bit um, policy. What goes on 
maybe at the uh, local level, the national level, the federal level, um, what kind of policies and legislations um, that have passed or that are pending might be of interest to anybody interested in this topic? So let's start locally here in New York City. Local Law 97, going off of what you already said about building emissions, it is like the New York City Buildings Green New Deal. Right. And it's a push to get all buildings to be sustainable by 2050, with landlords having to comply to start to make these changes by 2030. On nationally, we could think about how President Biden has still not declared climate change as a national emergency. Mm. We have made strides in this administration, thinking about infrastructure and green infrastructure, but we have also financed drilling projects here on American soil. So we kind of have this interesting conflict happening. We need to be clear with our messaging and clear with where our federal dollars are going. Finally, on a global level, uh, every year for the past 28 years, the UN has a big climate conference, Conference of the Parties, mm -hmm. COP. The Paris Agreement, which you might have heard of previously, happened at one of these COP conferences. So you might have heard of them, but not have been aware that these things happen every year. So it's important to not only stay engaged and stay reading on what's happening in these spaces, because even though we can make changes locally and nationally, climate is a global problem. So we need to make sure that we're informed on what other nations are doing to push the needle towards a more sustainable world. So if you wanna get more involved in actually climate action in the streets, uh, Fridays for Future organizes two big marches every year, one in September, which is happening on September 17th, and then one that always happens in March. Uh, the best way to stay informed of climate action happening throughout New York City is to follow these organizations on Instagram, sign up for their listservs on email, and feel free to contact the both of us. And we'd be more than happy to help anybody, any uh, alumnus, current student, faculty or staff, get more involved in the effort to be a sustainability advocate. Great. Thank you, Chris. Thank you so much.